All right, it's Tito here with the Buckeye Blitz. Thanks so much for tuning in. We're on Fan3 Sports. Go download the app. It's for free on Fan3 Sports, uh, the app for that for Apple and Android. Go check it out there. Go to Fan3Sports.com. Um, Fan3 Sports Facebook group to interact with other hosts of other shows. We have so many great shows on this uh, particular network we've got here with so many things all across the country, some of the better college teams and all that. We've got it all. Uh, make sure you check us out. We're adding new shows every single week with very, very talented people. Follow me on the X, formerly Twitter, at Fit Happens, where you can find me there. That's at Fit, T H I T Happens. Find me on that one. So much to talk about today. Not all what's great. So um, I, I guess start off talking about, we'll start in the positive, I guess, ish. The college football rankings came out on Tuesday, and Ohio State is sixth behind uh, Georgia, Michigan. Washington, which we all expected that, uh, all three undefeated teams, Florida State and then Oregon. Uh, Florida State undefeated as well. Oregon's got one loss there, one loss to Washington. So Ohio State, and we'll talk about the Michigan game in a little bit, but let's just start talking about the rankings here first. Um, The Buckeyes need help, obviously. Number six is about the lowest I wanted them to be with having a legitimate shot and still making it to the CFP. I thought if they were seven behind, like, Texas – then I saw an issue coming there. But Ohio State stayed ahead of Texas, so there's still some hope there for Ohio State, but um, they are going to need some help. So here we got Georgia playing Alabama. Uh, Ohio State needs Georgia to win that game. Uh, Michigan-Iowa, that game really doesn't matter. Michigan's going to get into the CFP no matter what happens against Iowa. Uh, Michigan, by the way, opened up as like a 22-point favorite against the Hawkeyes. Um, so they're expected to roll in that one. Uh, Washington plays Oregon on Friday night in the Pac-12 championship. I would think it'd be best for um, Ohio State if Washington wins that game and knocks Oregon down to a two-loss team. Uh, even if Oregon wins, though, you know I'm not convinced. I, I guess they probably would be. And I think the winner of Washington Oregon's in. I think the loser is out. I don't think more than one Pac-12 team gets in, no matter what hap- happens anywhere else. Florida State's got Louisville. Um, and that's one Ohio State will need Louisville to win that game. They're a slight underdog to Florida State. Florida State did not look good against Florida on Saturday night. As a matter of fact, there were several games in there where um, it, it was a close game or could have – there was a, the, with a favored team that Ohio State needed to lose was actually losing and not playing well. Georgia was trailing early to Georgia Tech. Uh, the Washington game, they won on a last-second field goal over Washington State. Uh, the, uh, the the Florida Florida State game. Florida State looked bad with their backup quarterback in there with Jordan Travis being out for the season. Florida could very easily have won that game. So, but none of the stuff happened the way Ohio State needed it to happen. But they still at, at six have got a shot at getting in. Oklahoma State being Texas would be nice. Also, not sure if it's completely necessary. It probably is, but not completely sure that it is. So, Ohio State will need some help if they want to make another appearance in the CFP. Um, and uh, let's now talk about what would happen. Okay, let's do this first. Then. It's a, it's incredible how, how much what happens on Saturday will affect Ohio State long term. By Saturday, meaning these conference, Friday and Saturday, the conference championship games before we get to the CFP. Think about this. If Ohio State misses the CFP, which is the more likely scenario, Okay, so now they're going to play in what's projected probably the Orange Bowl against Louisville or somebody like that. That might be the case they have. Uh, you got to believe Marvin Harrison Jr., Emeka Ibuka, maybe Travion Henderson, some of the defensive studs are not going to play in the game. If it's the Orange Bowl, which is a non-CFP game, you got to believe many of the studs will not play in the game. That also may give Ryan Day a reason to play, um, you know, Devin Brown, to play Lincoln Keenholz, more, more of those guys in the quarterback room which could also turn Kyle McCord off as far as what his long-term projection is for Ohio State. So if Ohio State doesn't make the CFP, you could see a lot of changes in the way the bowl game's played and also the future of Ohio State. Because if Ohio State doesn't get the CFP, i got to believe they're all re- they're open for business on transfers, and which might mean McCord is out, might mean uh, Devin Brown is out. Hell, it might mean Keenholz is out as well. Aaron Nolan's coming in the top-rated recruit. If Ohio State does get the CFP, now McCord has a chance to redeem himself a little bit and has a chance to do something the same way, although it wasn't quite to the extreme that was C.J. Stroud. We saw C.J. Stroud against Georgia, and I think he boosted his draft stock tremendously in that Georgia game last year. So McCord's got a shot to do something like that if Ohio State gets into the CFP. If they don't, 
Ohio State might start reevaluating a lot of things, and we'll see where that goes in the bowl game, how that affects the way they do things. So um, it's amazing Ohio State – is not playing on Saturday, not playing this weekend. But there are so many things involved with the CFP that could alter what Ohio State looks like next year. And, you know, I'm not convinced that Kyle McCord is a starting quarterback week one next year if Ohio State misses the CFP. Again, if they make it, he's got a chance to kind of redeem himself. If they don't, they might want to start considering what's 2024 going to look like. Um. And uh, on top of that, you know, the, the change in the staff, you might see some significant changes on the coaching staff. There's guys that are going to be up for head coaching jobs elsewhere. Um, you know, a Justin Fry, who played in Indiana, could be a candidate for the head coaching job there. Who knows about Jim Knowles if he'll get offers? The dude was phenomenal this the last two years at Ohio State. You know, I'm sure people will be calling about Brian Hartline. So there are a lot of different reasons why Ohio State, things will change dramatically based on what happens this weekend and Ohio State is not even playing. All right, let's talk about the game itself against Michigan. And I don't spend too much time on this. We're a few days out of it now, but Ohio State, look, um, I'm not going to hold the previous two years against Ryan Day because I do believe the science-stealing scandal did impact those games dramatically. That being said, Ryan Day got out-coached in this game. Uh, Ryan Day, after last year's game against Michigan, came out and said, oh, he was not going to – he thought he was too conservative and said that he was not going to be as conservative going forward. In the Georgia game, he certainly was not conservative. Against Michigan, though, on Saturday, he seemed to revert to that, the more conservative play calling. And there's the, uh, the fourth and two anchor was around midfield where they should have gone for it in the first half. There's the way he handled the clock at the end of the first half where instead of – um, you know, trying to gain a few more yards potentially to help out the field goal situation. He let the clock run down and attempted a field goal that ended up missing after Michigan called timeout. Those are just a couple of examples where Ohio State was way too conservative, I thought, in their play calling. Um, and so it just seems like Ryan Day and Ohio State did the same thing that last year. They were not aggressive enough in the way they were calling the plays. On the defensive side, Look, Ohio State, the, the first seven points Michigan scored was not the defense's fault. It was the offense's fault for an awful interception by Kyle McCord. McCord cannot make passes like that in big games. The second interception, I'm going to put on McCord. He got hit when he threw it. I get it. I really thought McCord was going to lead the team down the field and get a game-winning touchdown. Didn't happen. But McCord has not improved enough this year for me to where I think like, oh my God, this is the guy I want next year. There's no way he's going to the draft. There was talk about maybe him doing that. If he had a great year, not going to happen. McCord will either, I think all likely McCord is, is quarterbacking somewhere else next season. There are a lot of potential options out there for Ohio State as far as the transfer portals opening up. Look, if Quinn Ewer stays at Texas another year, Arch Manning comes into play. There's guys out there that are, um, the, the starting quarterback from Mississippi State might be an option. So there's a lot of guys out there that, they're going to be available in the transfer portal. I think Ohio State will explore that. I think Kyle McCord will play somewhere else next year other than Ohio State, unless Ohio State gets to the CFP and McCord does well there. A couple of interesting things. Uh, Maurice Claret came out. And look, I love Maurice Claret. Love his story. Love what he's done. But he came out before the Michigan game and was talking about, you know, giving Day a break, and he's a great coach and all these things. And as soon as the game ended, he was like, let's get rid of Ryan Day. And it's you can go back and look at his posts on the end X about that, but he completely flipped the script on that one and made a comment to Urban Meyer about, like, what are you doing next year? Like, they could bring back Urban Meyer. So, my take on the Ryan Day situation is this um, I, I am in no way, shape, or form in favor of making a coaching change. It would not surprise me if Ryan Day said, I want to go somewhere else. That would not surprise me at all. I don't think he will do it, but Ohio State is fortunate to have Ryan Day as a head coach. He runs a clean program. He truly cares about the players. Like, that's a real thing for him. Like, he really cares about the players and has a, an interest in their lives beyond football. So that's a rare thing today for high-level college football teams, to have a coach who really is invested in his players as much as Ryan Day is. I know he's lost games against big-time programs, but so – He's lost he's seven, like, you know, Michigan a couple of times. He's lost to Georgia. He's lost to Alabama. He's lost to Clemson. So those are the games he's losing. He lost to Oregon. 
um, in uh, in one of the, the uh, non-conference games. Remember, look, Urban Meyer lost to Iowa. He lost to Purdue. I know that he had a better record against Michigan. I know he won a national championship. I get that. He also got uh, motorboated by Clemson a couple of times, too. So I, it's just... I think Ryan Day is the right man for the job. So I am not in favor of making any kind of changes whatsoever. Keep this in mind. Ohio State has never had a catastrophic hire in football since night since they hired Woody Hayes back in 1951. Okay. They hired Woody Hayes. Since then, Hayes, right? Bruce, Cooper, Tressel, the one year of fickle, which is still fine. Urban. And now you've got Ryan Day. There are no catastrophic hires that set the program back years. Alabama's had that. Oklahoma hired Gary Gibbs. Alabama, Mike Shula. Uh, Nebraska, with their Nebraska's never been what they used to be since Tom Osborne left. Look at Penn State. Look at these other schools that have had Florida, Miami of Florida. Look at all these schools that have had issues by making bad coaching hires. Michigan, Rich Rodriguez, Brady Hope, Notre Dame. Dane, Charlie Weiss. Look at these different schools that have had bad hires that have set their program back years. Ohio State hasn't done that because they are patient and smart with their coaches. The dumbest firing Ohio State ever made was the Earl Bruce one since 1951. Fired him after he was the winningest coach in the Big Ten during his tenure and did well against Michigan. Cooper, yes, 2-10-1 against Michigan, but nonetheless was not a catastrophic hire. He elevated the program. If that's the worst hire you have in 70 years, that's okay. That's not bad. So don't make snap judgments on this for Ohio State. I like the fact they're patient. Texas A&M, they didn't hire Ryan Day. There's all kinds of talk that they that they would have, but they were going to move for him. And I, I'm sure Texas A&M reached out to some representatives of Ryan Day to see and probably determined that he was not going to consider leaving Ohio State for A&M. It'd be a step back. I know monetarily – Financially, all those things would have been different. But nonetheless, Ohio State, if Ryan Day would have left Ohio State for AM, it it'd be a step back for him. Uh, okay, let's talk about now December 20th, which is when the early signing period takes place for the 2024 class. And one of the bigger recruiting stories has involved Jeremiah Smith, who is a, a five-star wide receiver out of Hollywood, Park, or Hollywood Florida, um, in the class 2024. He committed to Ohio State back in June. And... Um, he's since then though, he's taken some visits recently to Florida, Florida state, put some kind of cryptic social media stuff out there. Like, you know, uh, insinuating that he might be rethinking his situation. I think he'll still come to Ohio state. Some people have as the number one player in the country, five-star receiver. And uh, like I say, top player in the country, according to some recruiting, some rating sites, but I think he will still come here. But December 20th though, is when the early signing period takes place for that. So keep an eye on that. Uh, so ESPN did something where they were talking about that he's one of the guys who they're watching, could flip. They don't think he will. Awards now. Uh, Tommy Eichenberger. Uh, Tommy Eichenberg. Eichenberg is a friend of mine. Tommy Eichenberg, best linebacker in the Big Ten. He won the Butkus Fitzgerald Linebacker of the Year Award. That was announced on Tuesday. Uh, he sat out a couple of games, but he got hurt against Rutgers, but he still had 80 tackles, and uh, uh, 40 of them were solo ta- tackles. So um, he is the linebacker of the year, the Butkus. Uh, again, it's called the Butkus and uh, Fitzgerald linebacker of the year for, for the Big Ten. He was named that one. Um, Eichenberg and uh, JT Tuomaloa and cornerback Denzel Burke all were first team Big Ten, first team all Big Ten, I should say, uh, for the 2023 season. Uh, Tuomaloa and Eichenberg were first team from both the coaches and the uh, the media. Burke, uh, coaches, first team team and on the uh, the media who is second team so uh jack sawyer the defensive end uh, who else got second team uh the kicker Jaden fielding who i thought had a decent year this year i, I know he missed the pick, kick against michigan wasn't an easy one though uh, he was second all team big 10 so was tyler williams and um that was according to uh uh the the, the media second team uh michael hall jr third team in the coaches selection steel chambers and josh proctor also third team, according to the media. Marvin Harrison Jr. is a finalist for the Litnikoff, Litnikoff Award as the top receiver in the country. Um, he will see what happens with that one, but he's been great this year, as always. Um, he ended up with 67 catches for 1,211 yards, 14 touchdowns, and 
first Ohio State player, obviously we know this, to have multiple thousand yard seasons. Um, and uh, he had another great year. But Cade Stover, finalist of the John Mackey Award, best tight end in college football for that one. Um, that'll be tough for him to get Brock Bowers and George in there too, but Bowers missed some time. But Stover, though, this year, uh, he had 41 receptions, 41 receptions, 576 yards and five touchdowns. And I like him a lot. I think he's great. And I think Stover's going to be one of those guys who is going to do better in the pros just because at Ohio State there were so many weapons on this team offensively, it was difficult to stand out. And one of the things Stover does great, though, is he's a great blocker. And as a tight end, if you can be a great blocker and a um, an elite receiver as far as a tight end goes, you can have a long career in the NFL. Stover wins prize first round if he's a first round pick in 2024 i think it's more likely second or third would surprise though if somebody goes up there and grabs him in the first round uh speaking of being recognized for greatness and this is something that happened on tuesday also eddie george former Ohio state running back he is among the players he's a, a semi-finalist for the class of 2024 in the hall of fame um the second time he's been named a semi-finalist the first time was for the class of 2022 so what happens is now a 12-person committee put them together. There's 25 what they're called modern era players um, that are semifinalists for this. And George, you know, obviously the great Ohio State career and um, in the College Football Hall of Fame already, won the Heisman Trophy, played for the Titans, actually played for the Oilers. Tells you how old he is. Oilers and the Titans. Um, he was a first-round draft pick back in 1996. He was offensive rookie of the year that year. And – he had a long career. Um, he was one of those guys, though, who got worn down by the number of touches he got. He had 970 carries um, in Tennessee. But um, I'm sorry, not more than that in Tennessee, but I'm sorry. I'm getting his, his numbers right here on this one. He ran for 5,506 5, yards for th- and 34 touchdowns on 1,428 carries. That's the number I'm looking for. I got this um, all off 11 Warriors. But um, – and then he finished his career in Dallas after he goes from Houston to Tennessee, then Dallas. So again, credit to 11 words for this information here. So um, what happens now is they will, will trim this list down. They will cut it down to 15 players. They've got uh, 25 on there now. They'll be 15. And then they will add in these um, the senior player nominees. And that will include Randy Gratishar. It also includes uh, Buddy Parker, a former coach, Art Powell, and Steve McMichael. So they'll have 19 when it's all said and done. And then they will announce the enshrinees on February 8th. Look, Eddie George is a Hall of Famer. They ran him into the ground with the number of carries he got. But for the first half of his career, he was as good as anybody was in the NFL as far as running backs go. So we'll see what happens with that. But that's on February 8th. We'll find that out. We'll find out beforehand who the finalists are. Hopefully Randy Gratishar gets in. Also, former Buckeye great linebacker um, that went on to play for the Denver Broncos in that Orange Crush defense. All right, let's move on now. Men's hoops. Um, they won the Emerald Coast Classic. Uh, they beat 17th ranked Alabama, 17th ranked at the time, the unbeaten Crimson Tide, and then also beat Santa Clara, also undefeated at the time, to win the Emerald Coast Classic down in Destin. Uh, Alabama came in at 4 0. They were averaging 102 points a game, and the Buckeyes um, held the Crimson Tide down in this one. Uh, they uh, Ohio State held them in the 80s there, and um, got the win against them. Uh, the Buckeyes were led by Bruce Thornton, who had 29 points. He made six of 12 uh, field goals overall, four of six on three, and made 13 of 14 free throws. Roddy Yale Jr., he added 23 points, was six for six from the line. The Buckeyes were 28 out of 30 from the charity stripe, 93.3%. Zed Key came off the bench and uh, continued to provide a spark. I love what Zed Key's game looks like these days. He comes in and plays limited minutes, but has a Big contribution. He had 11 points in 21 minutes. Ohio State scored 54 points in the second half of that game. And then the next night, the championship against Santa Clara, 86-56 to 56 route for Ohio State in this one. Um, the star offensively for Ohio State this time was Minnesota's transfer, J- Jameson Battle. He had 21 points, 5 of 10 on threes. Thornton added 13. Dale Bonner, the transfer from Baylor, he added 11 points, two of his three-point attempts. Um, the Buckeyes, uh, again, got a big second half, 52 points in that when They were 13 of 28 on threes for 46.4%. Zed Key played 17 minutes off the bench, 10 points, five rebounds. And the defense has been really good. Uh, I like what I've seen out of the backcourt. Um, you know, with Thornton has done really like the whole the backcourt has been the key. And we look at how these teams are going to do in the NCAA tournament. When, when you have Gale and Thornton in the backcourt doing what 
they were doing. And you can bring in Dale Bonner also, who's a good defender. Jameson Battle's a fantastic defender who can defend any position on the floor. That has been the key on this one. Jameson Battle is shooting uh, more confidently from the outside. Bonner seems to be more confident as well. And so the Ohio State Buckeyes men's basketball team getting that win, getting those wins down there in Destin was significant. The latest bracketology from Joe Lenardi has Ohio State as an eight seed, but only six Big Ten teams in the field, which kind of surprised me. In addition to Ohio State, you've got Northwestern, Purdue, Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan State. I think that number will go up as we get later into the season. But right now, Joe Lenardi has only six Big Ten teams in there. The Buckeyes have Central Michigan on Wednesday. Then they play Minnesota on Sunday, which will be a big game as they kick off their Big Ten schedule. Uh, they're going to have Penn State coming up soon, the game against UCLA, which will be part of the CBS Sports Classic. So we'll learn more about Ohio State and where they're at in the season. But, look, I'm telling you, I said from the beginning, I think Ohio State's an NCAA tournament team. I think when it's all said and done, they'll be like a five or a six seed. I'm surprised they weren't ranked this week in the AP and the coaches' poll. They will get there eventually. This team right now is improving every single game. The women's basketball team, right now in the latest bracketology, they're a three seed on ESPN. They're ranked 16th. They're five and one after they just destroyed Cornell on Sunday, 83 to 40. Cody McMahon led the way. She had 14 points, two rebounds, four assists, and two steals in 19 minutes. Amazing. Ohio State forced 26 turnovers from the big red of Cornell. Next up, though, a huge game for Ohio State. Uh, they'll travel to Knoxville to take on 20th ranked Tennessee Volunteers in a game being telecast on ESPN. That's on Sunday. So we'll see what happens there. But so much going on. And we'll, look, we'll talk again soon as we go through all this. Trans portal stuff's going to open up also. We got to see what happens in, in the uh, conference, in the, I'm sorry, the uh, conference championship games it's coming up this weekend. We'll get an eye on Ohio State with their game against um, Central Michigan on Wednesday. And we'll preview more of the OSU women. But um, thanks so much for tuning in. Again, download the app. It is a free app on Apple and Android. It's uh, Fantasy Sports. And then go to FantasySports.com. I'm Jeff Fidoff. Follow me on the X at Fit Happens. Let's talk again soon. Go Bucks.